Listen, this week I was having some coffee, normal coffee appointment, Bobby Broadway, David Brent on Wednesday morning, and we got onto the topic of dreams. And we've been studying dreams here in the book of Daniel, but we were really talking about the way God sometimes gets our attention through dreams. You know, some people say dreams, we talked about this, some people say dreams are just the overstimulated mind asleep. Filling your brain with, I don't know, marshmallows with legs and all kinds of crazy things, you know. But man, I have had some dreams that felt really real, and especially some nightmares. I've had a couple of nightmares where I woke up short of breath, cold sweats, body shaking, heart racing. Uh, Couldn't go back to sleep because what I had dreamed felt so real. Of course, after a few minutes, you know, assuring yourself everything's going to be okay, there's no need to call your mom, you're going to be fine, you know, all those sorts of things, uh, I realize it is just a dream. What I dream does not have any bearing on the real world. But I want you to imagine that your worst nightmare wasn't imaginary, figment of an overstimulated mind, but was actually a divine premonition and warning about things that were going to happen in the real world. Right? That's what Daniel experienced in Daniel chapter 8. He doesn't call it a dream, it's a vision. And he might have been awake when it happened, so it's a daydream. But in any case, what he saw is the stuff of nightmares. And it, without a doubt, came true. You see, God knew that Daniel and his people were going to face some terrible things in their lives. Terrible kingdoms were going to arise that were going to cause trouble for them and persecute them and bring devastation upon them. And he knew that if they didn't have forewarning about it, those terrible things were liable to knock them off course and to cause them to doubt his goodness. And so this morning, as we see Daniel chapter 8, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind that God spoke to Daniel to prepare his people for what was to come. And if we'll pay attention, We'll see how he intends to encourage us as well. We can be faithful in the fire, no matter how bad things get. If we remember that God is in control and nothing can upend his purpose to establish his kingdom. You know, we spent the past couple of weeks in Daniel chapter 7, which was a vision of Daniel's future, the future of Israel from Daniel's perspective till the end of time. Of course, we saw human dominion, human authority and kingship. How it's expressed in disordered and subhuman ways first in the Babylonian Empire, then in the Persian Empire, then in the Greek Empire, then in the Empire of the Romans, and then dispersed among the nations of the world who still complain about God's authority and rage against Him. We also saw that Jesus has even now begun a process of building a kingdom. He started His work already, but it hasn't yet come to its fulfillment. And so Daniel's second vision here in chapter 8 zooms in on the second and third kingdoms that he saw in chapter 7 to try to give some more understanding to what lay between Daniel and the final end of all things. And there are three things that God knew they were going to face that were liable to cause them to be discouraged. And the first was, get this, powerful competitors to God's claim of supremacy. Powerful competitors to God's claim of supremacy. So let's look at this, Daniel chapter 8. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar the king, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one in which appeared to me previously. I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam. And I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Uli canal. Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other with the longer one coming up last. And I saw the ram budding westward, northward, and southward, and no other beasts could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue him from his power. But he did as he pleased and magnified himself. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming up from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. 
he came up to the ram that had the two horns, which I had been seen standing in front of the canal, and it rushed at him in his mighty wrath. I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him, and he struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. But as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken, and in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Now here in Daniel chapter 8, we get the introduction to another vision. And I know what y'all are thinking. Thank God this one's less bizarre, right? No. Uh, no, again, just like in chapter 7, uh, we're drawn to these beasts. But they are, they are a little more conventional. I know almost nothing about rams and goats, to be honest with you. I had never clearly differentiated between them in my mind, even though I know rams are male sheep and there's male goats too. But anyway, I know nothing about this. Thankfully, Daniel knew all about it and was able to record it for us perfectly. Right? He sees this giant ram with two horns budding, head budding, westward, uh, northward, and southward. Has, like all rams do, two horns. But get this, the horns are asymmetrical, and one side is longer than the other. If you were here a couple weeks ago, this asymmetry of the beast may remind you of the second beast that Daniel saw emerge out of the sea, the bear that was lifted up on one side. I told you two weeks ago, I believe that bear is the Medo-Persian Empire, the United Empire of the Medes and the Persians. And there are actually some clues within this passage to, to make us believe that that's the case here as well. The asymmetry, of course, but also, did you notice that Daniel sees this vision and he finds himself in Susa, the capital of the province of Elam. At the time of this vision, the third year of Belshazzar, 550 or 549 BC or so, Elam was a province of the Persian Empire. And if you're a student of the Bible, you know the book of Esther takes place in the capital city of Susa in Persia. And so we start to get inclinations that maybe this beast, this ram with the two horns, is somehow connected to the Persian Empire. The other one is that this third year of Belshazzar, I told you 550, 549 B.C., is the same year that Cyrus conquered the Median Empire and brought them together as the Medo-Persian Empire. So we've got a couple of clues that indicate that maybe this ram with the two horns is the kingdom we know in history as the Medo-Persian Empire. But listen, we don't have to speculate. We don't have to guess. I don't have to show you my work and how I got to my answer. Because Daniel, later in this vision, gets confused again. And he asks for somebody to explain it to him. And God sends him the angel Gabriel, standing before him at the canal like a man. And Gabriel explains what the vision's all about. And in verse 22, we're going to kind of be flowing back and forth between Daniel's vision and Gabriel's explanation. In verse 22, Gabriel says, The ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. Right? No conflict there. We're all good, on the same page. But then, Daniel sees a unicorn goat with one horn coming off of its head between its two eyes. And it's not coming from the, the east, it's coming from the west. And it comes up directly to this ram and crushes its horns, tramples on top of it, right? And then this goat starts to magnify himself as the ram had done. And just when he seems to be at his strongest, when he's as big and as powerful as any male goat could be, his horn is broken and four horns rise in its place. Right? Gabriel brings some explanation to this. For Daniel, he says, The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. And the large horn that's between his eyes is the first king. And the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from his nation, although not with his power. Daniel 8, 21 and 22. The conspicuous horn on the goat's head coming right out from between his eyes is Alexander the Great, who between 334 and 331 B.C. broke down the Persian Empire piece by piece. You can actually go on Wikipedia and read about Alexander's conquest of Persia. Some of the most famous battles and most consequential battles for the ancient world were waged between Alexander and the Persians. But, unsurprisingly, given what God told Daniel, at the height of Alexander's power, 
He dies and had no male heir, no mature son to take his place. And so the political infighting that often happens in ancient kingdoms and modern nation states took over until eventually his kingdom was split up into four different kingdoms under the leadership of four of his generals. And those are the four horns. See, while Daniel 7, and this is what blows my mind away, as a student of the Bible, trying to understand God's Word and stand under the authority of it, I believe it is inspired and without error, okay? Y'all know that. But even sometimes, I read something and I have a hard time. I'm like, wow, God really did this. See, Daniel 7's enigmatic, open to interpretation. Uh, some say, like, you know, a fortune teller's fortune. You just fit it together with whatever you want. But Daniel 8 is so specific. It names names. It lays things out in black and white. No questions. Not open to interpretations. This is who this ram and this goat represent. One scholar said because of that, you know, it's less like a vision and more like a political cartoon that lampoons and satirizes key figures in the world. We obviously see that these kingdoms magnified themselves as God. They thought they were great. They were, get this, powerful competitors to God's claim of supremacy. In their own particular time and place in the ancient world, they said to everyone around them, we're in charge. You bow to us. But then we see the vision of Daniel 8. And when they're at the height of their power, things come crashing down. See, I believe the reason God gave such specific identification for the second and third beasts is because He knew that someday, as His people were living through the upheaval of kingdoms falling and crushing, can you imagine the sound of broken horns? The collision of two animals striking each other so hard that their horns shatter and break? You can imagine what it must have been like to live through the events that that symbolizes. And he knew if his people weren't aware, they weren't clued in to what he was doing, they'd be bound to wonder, who is really in charge of the world? Where's God in this mess? You see, we could probably use the same thing. Now, our world is still the victim in certain respects and in certain places to tyrannical competitors to God's claim of supremacy. You know, there are these totalitarian governments all across the face of the earth. They reign with an iron fist, keeping their people under their control. You think about the kind of surveillance systems that are out there, the administrative reach. They're like Big Brother from George Orwell's book, 1984. They can claim a sort of omniscience because they know everything about their people's lives. They can claim an all power. You cannot escape the long arm of of the state. Right? And then there are these tech companies who often assist the totalitarian regimes in their control. I know if you heard about China's big tech company, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Huawei? They, they just came out with this in the Washington Post last week. Huawei tested AI software that could recognize Uyghur minorities and alert police. They've got it glued in with their cameras. So everywhere you go on Surveillance. They've got a software program that can identify your ethnicity, alert the police, so they can round you up and take you away because they're all-knowing, they're all-powerful. No one resists. I mean, even in America, we have this. Everywhere we go, our cell phones log our location. You got Facebook on your phone? They know everything about you. Our web browsers document every website we visit. Thanks to the algorithms... The social media networks can silence trends, elevate other ones. They even know what you want to read before you do. And so they make sure that you see exactly what strokes every desire of our little dark hearts. They know everything. Now they wrote a, uh, an article I found, Michael Brand, publication, The Conversation, October 27th. Facebook is tilting the political playing field more than ever, and it's no accident. They can sway politics. And then, all these tech companies, social media giants, spend millions of dollars on lobbyists, swaying legislators, 
turning public policy in a way that benefits them, and I'm here, who's really in control? I know mentally, theologically, God is sovereign. He oversees everything. But sometimes it feels like there are some other people pulling strings. Who's in control? Then there are those other powerful claims to supremacy, competitors for God's authority as sovereign, things that hit closer to home. You know, I'm talking about the unexpected and life-altering trials that we face. Who's in control when the doctor walks in? It's cancer. Who's in control? We can't find the baby's heartbeat. Who's in control? When your car breaks down, you don't have the money to fix it. Who's in control when you're at your wit's end because your kids don't listen? When your relationship with your spouse is on the rocks? Who's in control when you can't find the energy motivation to get out of bed in the morning because you're so broken. Yeah, God is on his throne somewhere, but sure feels like my diagnosis got control of me today. Sure feels like my financial insecurity is running my life. Who's in control? And then we come to Daniel 8. God's in control. God's in control. Each of these kingdoms arises at its appointed time, and it comes crashing down when it's all said and done. This happened, God gave Daniel this vision 200 years before the specific guy, Alexander the Great, rises up, son of Philip of Macedon, starts compiling and concentrating all sort of Greek authority over himself and runs amok over the ancient world. 200 years. Who could have seen it coming? Only God. He wanted his people to know. Whatever your current circumstances look like, you think these empires are in charge, you think they're running the show, I saw it coming. It all happened under my control. I like the way one pastor put it. He said, no matter how great and menacing an empire may appear to be, it plays the role assigned to it by God on the revolving stage of world history. And then, when its lines are over, it slinks through the curtain backstage. God is in control. Whatever these powerful competitors to his claim of supremacy say, he's in charge. But that's not the only thing that was coming. God knew other things would have happened to his people's lives that would cause them to doubt his goodness and his ability to bring things to their intended end. And I'm thinking of political interference with worship. Look at verse 9 with me. Out of one of them, that's out of one of those little horns that arose on that goat, came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of the transgression, the host will be get up, given over to the horn, along with the regular sacrifice, and it will fling truth to the ground, run it through the mud, and perform its will and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply, while the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled. He said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. See, after the four horns come up, Daniel sees a little horn, a rather small horn. Right? And I know you're thinking back to last week and the little horn of chapter 7. And there are similarities between the little horn in chapter 7 and the little horn in chapter 8. There are intentional similarities because chapter 8's little horn foreshadows and sets the pattern that the little horn from chapter 7 is going to fulfill. Like, think about this. Here's one of the similarities. Both little horns represent a political leader. Right? I told you last week that I think the little horn in chapter 7 is the person the New Testament calls the man of lawlessness or Antichrist. 
right? This end time figure who will concentrate all human opposition to God under his leadership and authority. He'll lead the army in the final battle, defying God. But chapter 8 refers to someone else. I mean, it's obvious from the way Daniel sees it that this little horn comes out of one of the kingdoms that results from Alexander's defeat. And uh, we know exactly who this king was. He says that the king would arise out of one of the four kingdoms and grow toward the south and the east and make war on the Holy Land. Now, of these four kingdoms that developed from Alexander's fall, one you need to know is the Seleucid kingdom. The Seleucids ruled over Turkey and the Middle East from Syria to Iran. And at some point uh, in the year 175, a king, not in the direct line of succession from the original general who followed Alexander, but one of his great, 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 great nephews, seized the throne of the Seleucid Empire. His name was Antiochus IV. In 175 BC, he came to power. When he came to power, when he took the throne, he did. He ruled over Turkey and the Middle East. But pretty quickly, he made it his number one priority to make war and build his kingdom. His main target was the kingdom that developed from Alexander's empire in Egypt, the Ptolemaic kingdom. And so Antiochus marched his armies towards Egypt, and along the way he did battle against every one of the Ptolemies' rivals and allies. And the Jews in Jerusalem were Ptolemaic allies. One of his claims to fame is the great war he waged on the city of Jerusalem. We're going to see more in a second. Because the second similarity is that both of the horns make war against the people of God. Last week in chapter 7, we saw that the little horn makes war against the saints. Here, however, they're called the host of heaven, Daniel 8, verse 10. Now, some believe that this host of heaven represents angels, that this little horn's going to arise and make a heavenly war. And you all need to know, it's true. Majority of times, the Bible talks about the hosts of heaven. It talks about angels and stars. And there is an element of spiritual warfare tied up in Antiochus' rage in his campaign against Jerusalem. But there are also times in the Bible where Israel is called the host of God. And especially in the Exodus, the word host can mean companies, as in like the companies of an army. And so in Exodus 4, um, or Exodus 7, God told Moses that he was going to bring his hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. And then in Exodus 12, verse 41, Moses describes it and said, God led his hosts out of Egypt. I believe that the hosts in Daniel chapter 8 are the people of God, Israel, and that the commander of the host is none other than God himself. So when we think about this, I mean, we have to remember we're, we're in the apocalyptic genre that talks about kingdoms as beasts and kings as horns. So it's not surprising that it portrays the people of God as an angelic, heavenly army. And when Antiochus made war against Jerusalem, he brutally oppressed the people of God. Gabriel told him in 824 that he would destroy mighty men and the holy people. And in 169 B.C., he did that. He marched his armies into the city of Jerusalem, and he took it by force. Get this. He had the high priest, Onius III, killed. He rounded up all the copies of God's Word he could find, and he burned them. And anybody who had been smart enough to sort of hide away a personal scroll in their house, he tracked down with his secret police, brought them out into the street, and executed them. Brutal, brutal oppression. But the worst of it all, at least from the Jews' perspective, wasn't all of that. They'd suffered before. What was worst of all is what he did to the temple. Right? Daniel has this vision of the regular sacrifice being ceased for 2,300 morning and evenings and the holy place being trampled. Right? And this regular sacrifice is, is the daily offering that the priests offered to God day in and day out, year after year. Morning time, they did it. In the evening time, they did it. In Exodus 29, God gave the instructions for the sacrifice every day, twice a day, of a year-old goat, a measure of flour, a portion of oil, and wine. That was to be offered to the Lord on the altar, and the smoke that went up into heaven was to be received by Him as a fragrant aroma. Now, each of these elements is important. You've got the meat, the bread, 
the oil, and the wine. These are the elements of the kind of meal you might still get if you find a, a Mediterranean restaurant. And what it symbolized for the people was a fellowship that they had with God. That He came, pulled up a chair at the table with them, and fellowshiped in a meal. This regular offering was a sign of His covenant faithfulness. I'm your God. I'm here to be with you. In His presence. And so when the regular sacrifice is ceased, is done away with, it means that God's very presence, the very thing that symbolized His participation in covenant fellowship with His people, was removed. I mean, can you imagine Daniel's horror? I mean, I can imagine in his mind, he's looking forward to the day when God redeems His people from exile and brings them back to the promised land, and they dwell with Him forever, Him as their God, and they as His people, in perfect covenant fellowship. But this vision tells him it's not quite so good. Yeah, apparently, you are going to be back in the promised land at some point in the future, and you are going to have a rebuilt temple, but it's not going to be pie in the sky. Instead, at some time in the future, there's going to be a terrible intensification of what you already have experienced in Nebuchadnezzar. This is not a return to stay. This is a return to experience, once again, the very thing Daniel was sitting in Babylon suffering from. Alienation from God. But what's worse is what that one angel said to the other one. How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror? The transgression that causes horror. What, what transgression? 167 B.C. when Antiochus IV walked into Jerusalem. By this time, he'd given himself a nickname. We know him in history as Antiochus IV Epiphanes, from the Greek word that means manifest. He called himself Antiochus, God manifest, God in the flesh. He stamped his likeness on coins, Antiochus Epiphanes, God in the flesh. In 167, he marched himself into Jerusalem and wasn't satisfied slaying people in the streets, turning their stones red with blood. He walked right into the temple, and right up to the altar that had been consecrated for those daily sacrifices and the sin offerings before the Lord. And he took a golden statue that had been made to look like him, but dedicated to Zeus, and he placed it on top of the altar. Antiochus had taken this temple a place where God's name was supposed to dwell, a house of prayer for the nations, the site where God's people knew when we come to the temple, we meet with God. And he'd converted it from a place sacred and holy, set apart to the Lord, into a pagan high place dedicated to the worship of him. It was all about him. And the Jews at the time were living through a real-life nightmare. It's so bad that an entire rebellion starts up. Some priest, his sons, get so inflamed by the desecration of the temple, they lead an all-out war against Antiochus. And eventually they defeat him. They wrote a book, the book of 1 Maccabees, 2 Maccabees, that describes this rebellion. They call the transgression that caused horror a detested thing of desolation. And the Jewish historian, says that, uh, Josephus, says that for three and a half years, this is the way things were. No sacrifice, no fellowship with God. The political powers had done everything they could to interfere, prevent, and alter their worship. And God gave Daniel this vision so that his people would know when it was happening, don't lose your heads, don't lose your mind. My plan will prevail. See, Daniel tells us that political interference in worship isn't really an obstacle for God. You know, that's what the powers that be want to think. That if, hey, I can just convert this temple to worship something else, then what will people do? They'll just have to go along and worship it. They think if they persecute the church, they'll snuff it out, and then their claim to supremacy will be unrivaled. Nobody will be there to say, yeah, but God said he'll place his son on his throne, and one day he'll come and judge his enemies. 
And in every generation, God's people have suffered in this way. Pharaoh prevented Israel from leaving to worship their God. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple. Antiochus desecrated it. Nero persecuted the church in the first century. And today, tyrants and mobs, whether in North Korea, where there are 50,000 to 75,000, it's estimated, Christians in concentration camps in North Korea today. Or whether you're talking about Christians living in Afghanistan or Pakistan or Indonesia or Africa, where they gather for worship like this and bombs go off, everybody's killed, or the mob will come in and bring people out in the street and behead them. And there are a thousand other tiny little inconveniences that make life miserable for the people of God today. Political interference with worship is just kind of par for the course. Now, I'm not talking... You're going there. I'm just going to cut you off. I'm not talking necessarily about mask wearing. That's frustrating. I hate it. I don't know what you're thinking, what you're doing. Are you laughing at me, really? But maybe we are seeing the first trickle of political interference with worship in America today. I mean, maybe it's the unequal and arbitrary application of lockdown restrictions in California and Washington. i got a buddy who pastors in eastern Washington, a beautiful place converted to a Christmas village called Leavenworth. And, uh, you know, his church is not allowed to sing when they're there. They can sing, but only 15 people are allowed to sing, and they need to be nine feet apart to do so and wearing their masks. It's probably based on good science, not denying that. But, man, that's kind of crazy, right? Maybe it's that. Maybe it's arbitrary, unequal application of lockdown restrictions. I don't know. Maybe it's the form of pressure campaigns to try to force churches to adjust their beliefs to the spirit of the age. Or you get your YouTube account shut down, your Facebook, spouting that hate speech. We run into problems with our live stream, but that's pretty minor, comparatively. What about stuff like tax-exempt status for churches? What about, like, the church this week that was celebrating a uh, pro-life mass and a train of abortion activists come in the side door shouting obscenities and profanities? Two, four, six, eight, this church preaches hate. I think that's full political interference with worship. Are we going to see more of that? I don't know. But I can tell you if we do, don't get the wrong idea. God's purpose can't be upended by political interference with worship. You may try. I'm going to be here to the last breath I take, preaching Jesus, serving the Lord. I'll get another job if I have to. I know in whom I believed. And I know that He's able to to guard what I have entrusted to Him until that day. Take my job. Take my life. I know whose I am. And I will not allow political interference with worship to get me distracted from what God is doing in this world. But then there's this other thing. Not just powerful competitors to God's claim of supremacy or political interference with worship. There's actually something more dangerous and deadly for a person's faith than that. That's what God comes to with Daniel at the very end of chapter 8. As Gabriel's finishing his interpretation of the vision, he tells him in verse 26, The vision of the evenings and mornings which has been told is true. It's true. Not going to wiggle your way out of this and think maybe things are wrong. It's true. Okay, Daniel, this is coming. But keep the vision secret for it pertains to many days in the future. Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up again and carried on the king's business. But I was astounded at the vision, and there was none to explain it. Listen, the most dangerous and deadly set of circumstances in our lives as Christians today is not government, not tech companies, It's our personal disorientation and despair that arises from what we're living through. 
See, Daniel, he's in the dark on all this stuff. We get to sit up here and I get to read commentaries explaining Antiochus Epiphanes and say great words that I'll never say again, you know. Daniel doesn't get any of that. He's living 300 years before all these events happen. He doesn't know who Alexander the Great is. He wouldn't know Antiochus Epiphanes if you saw him on the street. He's in the dark. And worse than that, God has enshrined him in a cone of silence. We like to talk about our dreams. That's how we got on the topic Wednesday morning. I had this crazy dream last night. Daniel can't even do that. He can't go to his buddy and say, hey, man, I just had this crazy dream. God told me it's a warning. Get this. Here he is, all alone, sealing up prophecy. That's good for the people who are going to live through it and are going to have the benefit of Daniel chapter 8 to interpret the times they're in. But it doesn't do any, Daniel any good. And knowing terrible things are coming and not being able to do anything or say anything about it has to be demoralizing. Daniel's got the answers. He can't say anything. And so he's emotionally, spiritually drained and physically sick for days about what he's seen. And I know exactly how he felt. You know, I've never, I don't believe, I've ever had some kind of divine premonition and warning of end-time judgment come to me in a dream. But I know apocalypse because I'm living through it. I see it all around me. You don't have to be a Bible scholar or a genius to know that what's happening in our world is significant on a spiritual level. And I so badly want to know what the outcome of politics is going to be. Where are we headed? Oh, if I only knew what the end result would be. I want to know what the mess of the last year means long term for our church. We're going to get to a point where we go back to normal and masks come off. Are people going to feel weird if we go door to door and tell them about Jesus? Are people going to feel comfortable sending their kids to youth camp where God makes such an impact in their lives? And from my vantage point, it's kind of, and maybe you're here with me, from our vantage point, let's say, it's hard to see how things get better. What great set of circumstances would have to happen to cause the turmoil and social upheaval in our nation to get smoothed out, for us to find common loves again, to where we don't divide over every issue along partisan political lines. I don't know. I don't see it. I can't see it. And so I worry about what's going to happen 20 years from now, Central Baptist Church. What's our church going to look like in 2050? I worry about my wife and kids. What kind of world are my kids going to have to live in? What pressures are they going to face? I worry about you. About health stuff. Nightmare of cancer diagnosis. I did two funerals this week. I hate funerals. It's a privilege and an honor to be with a family at the end. But oh, it brings me down. It's so hard. I hate what COVID has done to your retirement plans, the trips you intended to take. How when you're supposed to be enjoying the fruits of a faithful life, your families are separated. And I've been grieving loss. I worry about kids struggling in school. I worry about our neighbors who are hungry. I worry about the people smoking meth and selling drugs three streets over. And I look at it all. Apocalypse before my very eyes. I say, God, are you really in control? Where are you? How long? It's a nightmare. Every day, playing out in real time, over and over and over and over. Despair may not be the most godly reaction, but it's certainly understandable 
given the circumstances. But then I have to preach Daniel 8. I have to figure out what God might be saying to these people. And I see that no matter how dark things appear, God's still on His throne. That even under the worst imaginable circumstances, the worst case scenario, God is still sovereign over your world, over your life, your family. He doesn't take a holiday because things get crazy. He doesn't jet away to some island somewhere and enjoy time off. There's no problem so big that God can't overcome it. I think about Daniel, uh, Joseph. We read about him on Friday morning, if you're following along in our reading plan. Whose brothers betrayed him, sold him into slavery. He spends years in an Egyptian prison. Finally, the story resolves. He and his brothers are reunited. But they've got this sneaking suspicion that now that Jacob, Israel, is dead, Joseph's finally going to get his revenge. Understandable, given the circumstances. But Joseph somehow finds it within himself, certainly a work of God in his life, that he could say of God, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. No circumstance, not being sold into slavery, not being stuck in a prison and forgotten about, not being betrayed by the family that you love, could upend God's purpose. No, we're talking about the God who heard his people's cry of affliction after 400 years in slavery and brought them out. Who brought his people back home after 70 years in exile and after 2300 mornings and evenings, what Josephus says is three and a half years, brought Antiochus to his end, not in a violent way, but get this, of natural causes. Say supernatural causes. His time was up, his lines were done, and God brought him down. We're talking about the God who in the fullness of time sent his son to enter into the brokenness and darkness of the human world so deeply, not as an observer and a cheerleader. Come on, guys, you can do this. But he entered in so deeply that after living a perfect life, completely obedient in a thousand ways that you and I fail every day. The Romans, at the behest of the Jews, strung him up on a cross where he breathed his last and then he was buried in a tomb. You know, we talk about despair, disorientation. I mean, you got to put yourself in his disciples' shoes. They were so afraid because they knew the same people that hated Jesus hated them too because they were his people and they identified publicly with him. And so they locked themselves away in safe rooms in their houses. Some of them even made the seven mile trek back to Emmaus where I guess they'd go about their normal lives. And Jesus, being raised and them not knowing it, came to them in their disorientation and despair. Talking to them. Why are you guys so sad? said, haven't you heard what just happened? They tell him the story about Jesus being a good teacher, dying on a cross. And they say this, Luke 24, 21. We had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. Back then, we'd had this hope resting on him. That maybe this was the time when God was going to show up and do what He said He was going to do. He's going to redeem Israel, be with us, God among His people. We'd hoped, but it's obvious now, given the circumstances, our hope was misplaced. We were wrong. Jesus says to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter into His glory? Listen, if God can overcome death, hell, and the grave just as he did in the resurrection of Jesus, nothing, nothing can prevent him from accomplishing his purpose and bringing all things under the dominion of his Son. And so don't let your personal disorientation and despair get you off track. Listen, church, 
God's word to us this morning is simple. We can be faithful for our present moment and for the future because no matter how bad things get, nothing can upend God's plan for us. He's going to establish his kingdom. Powerful competitors to his claim of supremacy. Do what you want. Try to interfere with our worship. Personal despair, you got no place in here. I'm trusting in Jesus. He's going to do what he said he's going to do. So this morning, I want to challenge you. Renew your commitment to hope and press towards his kingdom. Don't let your present circumstances, particular to your own life and perspective, get you off track of what God is doing in our world. Yes, stuff's going to happen. Things are going to get worse before they get better. But guess what? God's still on His throne. Jesus is coming again, and He's going to establish His perfect kingdom. And even the worst-case scenarios bring Him praise. When you think about the way people resist persecution and stand up under pressure. The church father from North Africa, Tertullian, said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, Peter stands up and preaches a message and he says, You had Jesus crucified, but it was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Even the worst case scenario worked together in God's wonderful wisdom to fulfill His purpose. So keep hoping and pressing towards the kingdom. Keep hoping and pressing because the day of His return is one day closer. One day closer. You think about that. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation, what joy shall fill my heart. Wow. One day closer to that moment. Yeah, life is tough. There's diagnoses to deal with. There's suffering and grief to mourn over. But we are one day closer to the day when He returns to establish His kingdom. Keep hoping and pressing. Don't give up on the mission. Doesn't matter the circumstances. Children still need to be brought up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Wives still need to be loved sacrificially as Christ loved the church. Just because things are tough out there, you got a lot on your mind, doesn't give you permission to pull back from the mission. One of my pastors used to tell me, take your faith, your family, your problems to God. Our families don't need us venting, moaning, woe is me, can you believe what happened today? They need to hear somebody, mom needs to stand up if dad won't do it, and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We'll do what we're going to do. I know where I'm going. I know what mission I've been given. Nothing, no powerful competitor to God's claim of supremacy, no political interference with my life, no personal despair or disorientation is going to get in the way. My eyes are fixed on Jesus, and I'm running my race as hard as I can. Somebody better fall in line behind me. Press on towards the kingdom. Don't give up on the mission. Paul says, don't grow weary in doing good, for in due season we reap if we don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. There's a harvest of righteousness waiting for those who finish the race. Paul calls it a crown of righteousness laid up for those who long for the appearing of Jesus. Don't get your eyes off of Jesus. Pursue the mission. And that means some of y'all need to choose today to live for Jesus. I don't know how people who are far from God make it. I'm a weaker person than they are. I'd lose my mind if I didn't know Jesus. And maybe today you've been looking for some kind of answer, something that's going to give you hope, help you stay the course of life, do the things you want to do, become the person you want to be. Thought maybe some political person was going to solve your problem. They're not going to. Never can. They express their dominion in subhuman and disordered ways. All they know how to do is serve themselves. Think maybe if you graduate from high school, go to the perfect college, and get that degree, you're going to get that perfect job, and you're going to be set. You're going to have all the money you need, all your worries are going to be behind you. Hey, listen, Biggie Smalls was right. More money, more problems. It's not going to solve things. You think beauty is going to open doors for you that nobody can shut. Hey, take it from me. Every day you get uglier. 
You need to trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. He is the only one who provides any sort of hope for the future. The Apostle Peter put it like this. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has caused us to be born again to a resurrection through Jesus Christ from the dead, to inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, and is kept in heaven for us, who by God's power are being guarded for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You can't get there on your own strength. You can't buy your way. God doesn't care what you look like. What He cares about is do you know Jesus? Today's the day you stop putting your hope and trust in those other things. Bow down before Him and confess Him as Lord. I'm going to pray for you in just a minute. I don't know your name. I don't know who you are. But i got to believe that you're here because all morning felt like somebody was going to be here today that God wanted to be here. You know exactly who you are. And in a moment when I pray, I want to just invite you to raise your hand so I'll know to be praying for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to come down. I just want to know where you're sitting so I can pray specifically for you. Church, are you ready to press harder than you've ever pressed for the kingdom of God? To run with all the energy that's left in your body so that you can finish your race? Let's ask God to help us.